Well, how do you spark a kid's interest in science? How do you spark a teenager's interest in science? And most importantly, how do you turn that spark into, hopefully, a roaring fire? It's a really important question in Australia because we have a science education crisis. Not enough kids are doing uh, science and mathematics in grade 11 and 12, and even fewer are going on to do science, technology, engineering and maths at university. And that's a big problem because we have some big problems to solve. It's also really strange to me because uh, science asks some of the most profound, some of the biggest existential questions that human beings like to ask. Things like, why are we here? What are we made out of? Why do we die? Uh, how will this universe end? And if you're a teenager, most importantly, is that likely to happen in my lifetime? Um, they love to think about this stuff and they particularly like it when adults are honest about the fact that we don't know. And scientists are really good at answering those questions honestly. So let me show you some stuff that we don't know. Uh, this is a piece of PVC. You can buy it from a hardware store. This is a little bit of plastic that has a coating on it which makes it an electrical conductor. You can use a piece of audio cassette tape if you've still got one lying around. Tie it in a little loop. This is a bit more visible for a large audience. So I rub this under my armpit on my woolly jumper. You can use your clean hair. I've got product in mine. Um, <laughs> and now this happens. It's amazing. It's a kid's toy. It's showing you two of the most profound questions in all of theoretical physics. First, why is it that uh, gravity, which pulls everything down, is only ever an attractive force? Whereas electromagnetism, another fundamental force in the universe, can be both attractive and repulsive. It's repelling this thing, it's levitating. And yet, when it touches my hand, it discharges. Charge it up again, off it goes. This is totally amazing. The, um, the other profound question that we're showing here is that, well, look, I'm standing on this planet. It's huge. It weighs six million billion billion kilograms. That's a six with 24 zeros after it. And yet all of that gravity, I can beat it by simply rubbing a piece of plastic on a woolly jumper because the electromagnetic force is about 10 to the power of 40 times stronger than gravity. It's amazing. We don't know why that is. We have no idea. Well, we're getting somewhere, but we're doing lots of experiments. Uh, not me personally, obviously, but the Large Hadron Collider is one of our humanity's attempt to answer these huge, big questions. They're fascinating. Uh, so you can do this subject at school. It's called physics. I did it. Uh, <laughs> grade 11 and 12. So what does it look like if you decide to do physics? Well, here's what my first physics lesson looked like. An introduction to the international system of units. Very important. One of the wonders of the modern world, this system. But it's not the best way to get a 15-year-old kid hooked on this grand subject called physics. Now, you might think I'm here to criticise teachers. I'm honestly not. In fact, here is my Year 11 physics teacher, Mr Forbes. I stay in touch with him quite regularly, um, and I asked him if I could show him this photo because he agrees we should be doing more demonstrations rather than just talking about this stuff, but he was never trained to do it. He does it now. He's fallen in love with science demonstrations the same way I have. Um, so I'm not complaining. I really enjoyed my time with Mr Forbes, and so much so that I decided to go on and do uh, physics at university, this university. Um, and when you go to universities, they have these awesome things lying around, like liquid nitrogen. <laughs> so let me show And they've got tons of this stuff. Every university does. So just pop these on. Take that off. So here is some liquid nitrogen. And um, it's a liquid that boils at minus 196 degrees Celsius. And it looks like boiling water, and it does totally awesome things. For instance, if you pour some onto an ordinary balloon, it does something really radical. The balloon doesn't pop. It's getting really, really cold. It shrinks. This is pure physics that you're seeing here. And if you take that out of there, 
it will do something equally remarkable and come back to life, which is pretty cool. Uh, you can make it even cooler if you get another balloon, like maybe this one, and chuck that in there, right, one I prepared earlier, and just chuck that in there, chuck a bit of liquid nitrogen on top, and then it shrinks just as you would now expect. A bit of string on there, what's that doing? Hmm. Um, so then chuck that in there, and this balloon comes back to life, and then usually does something pretty remarkable. It's coming. Up you come. Wait, get out of there. This one's obviously filled with a different gas. It's called helium. It's different because at the uh, nucleus of this substance, there are two protons. This stuff, liquid nitrogen, has seven protons at its nucleus. Oxygen has eight. Carbon has six. This is all pure physics. Uh, you, can, you learn about this in a subject which we call the kinetic theory of gases. And I did that here in a, uh, a subject called um, vacuum physics. I'll show you the first lecture that I got in uh, the kinetic theory of gases. Look like that. <laughs> no idea where this was going. This is actually fantastic. The mathematics of the random walk is amazing because it leads you to uh, the solution that tells you how fast these molecules are going, why do they put so much pressure on the containers they're in, why do they shrink. They're going about 1,500 kilometres an hour in here. Uh, they don't go very far before they bump into another molecule, though, a few nanometers and then they bounce back the other way. This is all pure physics, and this mathematics is really amazing, but it's not the best way to get a 19-year-old kid hooked on the idea that we can use this to start the Industrial Revolution. This mathematics led to the invention of the steam engine, and it changed the world. So what am I trying to say? Well, I'm not the first person to come up with the idea of doing demonstrations. I take no credit for the idea that science is fascinating, awesome to watch. No credit whatsoever, I can't. It's been happening long before I ever did a demonstration anywhere near a TV. Uh, these people were doing it long before me. <laughs> this is Dean and Rob from the Curiosity Show. People smile when they see them. Uh, before them, there was Professor Julius Sumner Miller, an absolute legend. Over in America, Bill Nye the Science Guy is incredibly popular. But before all of these people, they can't take the credit either because, well, here is the English 20-pound note and it celebrates the science demonstration in this corner here. It's a reproduction of a painting. It's a painting of a science demonstration going on. This is Michael Faraday. He inaugurated the Royal Institution's Christmas Lectures for Children. They've been going ever since. They are hugely popular. Science demonstrations are one of the most entertaining things you can possibly do. And yet, we don't value them. Uh, I don't criticise any of my lecturers that taught me physics, but I never saw liquid nitrogen in a lecture theatre once. And I'm not angry about that. It's because we don't value this kind of teaching, and yet, why don't we value it? It's so incredibly useful. And yet, most people think that science is completely boring, which breaks my heart. I've visited 2,000 schools in the last 20 years. I've spoken to about 200,000 school kids from preschool to grade 12. Um, I ask them, what's happening in your science class? What are you doing? Are you doing experiments? Does a teacher do demonstrations? And I do get great examples of teachers that do do that but it's generally not the norm. In fact, it's by far not the norm, and the teachers that do do it seem to be having to go the extra mile beyond the call of duty. We should mandate this stuff so that teachers have to do it, but not in an awful way. We should equip them with the materials they need to make it happen, train them to make the big connections between what we don't know in science. We don't know why we die. We don't even know why we need to sleep. We have no idea how to solve the problem of cancer. Um, there are these massive science questions that we could potentially fix if we can get more kids doing science at university. If we can spark their interest and then turn it into a roaring fire, we might just get there. So it's a plea today from me on behalf of all learners, a plea to all teachers, primary school, high school, university, please do more demonstrations and please, every day, 
show us something amazing. Thank you.